available online. Um, I'll just click continue. Um, what is publicly available online um, for the sake of kind of going through it. Um, and I think the most important thing, even though it seems really obvious to actually answer the question that's being asked, you might have a lot of stuff that you want to say, um, but you need to try to weave it into what they're, what they're wanting to hear and how they're wanting you to answer that. Um, so these are the white space questions from 2022. Um, and it really kind of splits it up nicely because it, it says explicitly career goals, achievements, experience, program interests and um, so as I imagine most of you know the most of the SFP programs are based around research and um, but there are particular ones for education and teaching and leadership and management in certain deaneries and um, so being able to kind of say which ones you're interested in then leads on to different set of questions for those but they're all interested in things like teamwork and things like the general ones at the bottom there and um, in terms of optimizing being part of an SFP program and the things like the achievements and career goals, all the stuff you'd expect to be able to sell yourself with, all the stuff that's on your CV, all the stuff you've worked really hard in medical school kind of collating, you will be able to talk about in, in these. Um, and essentially for the point of kind of going through them, I just thought we could chat through the ones that I put forward. Um, these will be really, really unique to you. So they're really hard to compare with anybody and I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, but it's a bit all about how you show what you've done because you all have done absolutely amazing and wonderful things. And like I said, it's nicely split up into domains. Um, if it helps, what's a good thing is either if you have a CV or you're writing a CV and just to know what you have that's unique to you um, that fits into each of these domains. So say career goals, what do you want to do? Do you want to be a surgeon who works in translational cancer research? Do you want to be a clinical trialist? What, what is it that makes you tick? And make it as unique as you can. It's coming from a junior stage, so you want to train to be a good clinician first of all, but what actually, what have you engaged with so far that you want to actually take further in an SFP? Um, and kind of tying into that, what have you done so far? What are your achievements? What's your experience? What can you show in terms of that? Um, and they're what we bring to those programmes. Which one of those are you interested in? Um, and there's no reason why a great oncology SFP can actually be an education one. Um, we know that there's, um, I think you guys have done some research on this, that there's um, a kind of lacking in terms of education around oncology. So what, what are you interested in? These are supposed to be unique. Um, teamwork and permeates through all branches of medicine, cancer, really important MDTs. And um, we work really closely with our nurse specialists, our occupational therapists. Um, so kind of weaving and stuff you've done to that, you want to create a narrative that you would be a good candidate to be essentially a clinical academic. And that's what essentially what I've said, what CV, what have you done? So don't compare it to other people. Sit, write it down, list it out. What's more most relevant? Do you you might have loads of little small projects on the go, but was there a big one that you maybe did as part of your BSc, as part of time out doing a PhD, that's kind of the one you want to make sure you really mention, and then how can you weave in other things? Um, and draft, 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 get stuff written down, get it on paper. It's only through kind of seeing it and reading it and getting other people to read it. Um, would highly recommend that, even if it's just a non-medical parent, your friends, having other people read what you've written, and does it actually say what you think it's saying? Um, it is really important to have, leave yourself plenty of time for these. They don't make themselves quickly. Um, and tied into that, there's no time like the present. Um, the questions for this year aren't released yet. Um, it's a bit early for that. Um, but you might, they're unlikely to be very different from the previous years, even if you're just kind of collecting your thoughts, thinking about what you would want to mention and give nice phrases and sentences that are relevant to you. Might as well do that now. Um, the final year, a year leading up to these, a busy year, you'll have exams, you'll have loads of other stuff going on. So kind of work around it when you can so that you can spend the correct amount of time on it um, and give yourself an absolute best shot getting into the programme you want to. I put this in because it does make me laugh. Um, then, and it was one of the ones last year. Um, it, it, you essentially are like, why are they asking about dark matter and astrophysics? And it makes the question seem really scary and really unnecessary. This was a question for Cambridge the year that I applied. And I remember looking at it and being like, I'm so grateful I'm not applying to Cambridge. Um, but essentially it's a roundabout way of asking you about like a high priority challenge in medicine and a reason for your choice. You don't need to come back to the fact it's about dark matter. Um, I would recommend not. Um, and kind of things like, just think about what they're actually asking. What's a high priority challenge in medicine? Issues of an aging population, cancer is one that need 
so many different things. So actually, don't be scared by the questions. Just look at what they're actually asking and what can you bring to that? Um, what, are, what are you good at? What makes you tick? Um, I say that because you'll all be great at lots of things. Uh, these are essentially my answers. Um, you can screenshot them if you want. It's partly my life story through medical school. So um, do with that what you will. Um, there, this, these were, were the questions for Scotland and for Northern, um, which were the two deaneries I applied for um, two years ago now. Um, so the year I applied. They're quite similar, so we won't pour through every single one of them, but they're also the useful thing is they're quite similar to the ones they asked last year, and they're probably quite similar to the ones that they'll ask this year. Um, in terms of this effect is the first domain about career goals. So it's a good idea to think about how you would answer that. Um, I think I've got an underlying kind of salient points, which I think are relevant to both white space and interview. It seems like there's lots of them, but say in terms of saying that you're interested in a career in clinical and academic medicine and I put clinical first and I actually I, I did that interviews and things as well because effectively if you wanted to be a pure researcher you could leave medicine after your medical degree there's no reason you need to work as a as, an, as a, a clinician at all with a medical degree and there's no reason you had to go to medical school in the first place the people who discover the drugs that cure cancer are not doctors they are they're highly trained laboratory technicians they are a re pure research scientists in um, cellular biology they're not doctors um, so what you are applying for is a program to be a clinical academic um, and it's really important to kind of weave that in they want to know that you have an understanding of that that this is about the interface of research or of kind of educational research or leadership research and patients and it, 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 you, so that's where you, you you're setting your mast using kind of active words to say I have actively sought out research opportunities you want to make it seem like you have done a lot of things not I've been handed these in a platter because I've had really good research and um, like research mentors um, and what are you interested in interested in cancer research and I can underline the next bit in terms of multifarious phenotype uh, tumor types inspirational multidisciplinary teams which is a lot of big words um, but just in terms of saying what are you actually interested in can I then come on to the second point of the paragraph and that what you want to show from this is that you've got output already from these things because that's how they score you um a certain amount of scoring is to do with how many posters do you have how many oral presentations do you have do you have papers how many of those um are you first offer blah blah, blah. the caveat on that you don't need to have any papers i did not have any papers when i applied to and got into my top choice to academic foundation programs great if you do um, but don't let that don't let that put you off in any regards. Um, so I mentioned the output that I had. I said I presented these work at conferences, um, and it did happen. One of those posters had done quite well and won a prize. Um, I I did not have a paper. So see what you have done, not what you haven't done. Um, a lot of people that apply to AFP, and again, it's not a prerequisite. I know people that haven't uh, have extra degrees. So I mentioned that to first class honours. And then kind of showing them what skills they want you to have. I'm saying this displays strong academic commitments and enthusiasm and scientific communication. Um, and then again, two other prizes. So kind of being able to break it down saying like what you want to do, what you've done, what you've got from that and how that will make you a good candidate to them. What attributes, what have you learned from that um, are kind of, will basically just circle around in different ways and different questions then saying in terms of the fact that it sounds clinical competencies and again bring attention to patient care alongside research and teaching commitments because every every doctor in the NHS does have a commitment to teaching whether this is a teaching a program or a research program now sometimes research programs are still brought in teaching to it um, so mentioning things like that what would the academic foundation program or specialist foundation program let you pursue so here's another thing. I, I quite like lists of three. There's stuff online if you Google that. Um, if you're if you're listing things, list them in threes. Um, it's much more catchy. People like it. You've probably been told this before. But this would let me pursue cancer research, data analysis, and practical laboratory skills, um, which are three kind of buzzwords effectively. So think about the kind of research you'd like to do, um, and what you would get, what you get from that. What are those skill sets, and kind of being able to weave those in. And then this is about career plans. So I'm saying that I'm in touch with supervisors, I'm trying to formulate research questions, get mentors. And this 
they've asked about this at interview quite often in terms of like kind of five and ten year plans so I'm saying I would like to be a specialty trainee on the academic track um, which in England at least is the, um, the program by which you go theoretically you could apply straight through being a medical student of academic interest to an SFP doctor to an academic clinical fellow to a PhD to um, a clinical lecture post so there's kind of I'm sure you've seen those diagrams before um, and that you'd awareness that you would be applying for PhD funding and things like that and that that would allow you to in a supportive manner um, become like a future research leader however you phrase these things these when you're answering these it's not the time to be particularly humble or say oh maybe I won't do that maybe I just want to explore it's the time to say no this is what I want to do I would like the opportunity to have that and kind of having the confidence to say that as well um, and then can we again, again what you've done I was the oncology president um, as I said at my uni again list of free management task delegation teaching things that you will need to do um, as a clinical academic and then kind of almost like an admission statement at the end um, that if I could result in fewer patients with cancer requiring palliative care that would be my highest reward um, and it's really nice because actually that's what I'm doing in my AFP programme which I didn't know when I wrote these um, but I am in a phase one trials unit um, so think about what you're actually interested in you can kind of manifest it through these and get those opportunities this is like a, just another one really is in terms of answering the question about we recognise applicants with varying levels of research and teaching experience. Give one example in your medical school career um, to date of a research project or teaching experience and its significance to your application for AFP, SFP. Again, it's not quite the same wording that we use just now because they've tried to kind of split the teaching and the research, um, which I think is quite correct. But again, this is a case of answering the question. For me, it was a research experience. So I was applying for research AFPs. Um, I think this is a good example of kind of putting things in ways that researchers are used to reading. I'm not totally sure who reads white space questions. Um, certainly when you're interviewed, it's kind of um, doctors with research interests and the, the trust that you're applying to its professors. I don't know how, I don't know who exactly in that uh, reads, the, reads the white space ones. I've never asked or encountered anybody, but it's probably a, a kind of level of like clinical lecture at least. Um, they're used to reading things like this when you're talking about research in, in the form of an abstract, um, which I'm sure many of you have written them. You've got your like introduction, aim, methods, results, conclusions. And I kind of almost wrote this as that. You can't talk about a research program that you've done anything of without almost having an introduction. Then it goes on to say my project aims to find molecular and clinical predictors of outcome for pancreatic adenocarcinomas. And to literally write it almost in a way that they're used to processing and used to saying, oh yeah, this sounds this sounds scientific, this sounds like that. Um, so this question almost reads like an abstract. Um, and then no matter what project you have been involved with, I'm sure lots of you have been involved with loads of things, whether that's just departmental audits, whether that's up to linking with kind of national things, there's a certain way to glamorise what you've done without in any way fabricating that. But I spent a lot of time in this, looking at filling in large spreadsheets of data about, off like e-records and um, things to find out like what were people's uh, CN99s at different time points, what date did they have a scan, what date was this, and setting like this on Excel. But that covered extensive interrogation of clinical information for a large data set of patients, it required time management, team meetings with seniors, required uncertain areas, and accurate confidential data recording. So actually, even if you think, oh, I'm just sitting here with this massive Excel spreadsheet, um, it's going to be a good output at the end, but I'm bashing my head off a brick wall. Think about what that actually is. You'll have done so much more and learned so much more from it than you think, even if it was a project that took a long time or is really tedious or you don't feel like you're doing much along the way. Um, and saying that this helps you with information technology, quantitative statistical analysis and critical thinking. So things that are kind of buzzwords in that. Um, there's a real appreciation among kind of junior clinical academics that you can code, if you can use R, things like that, mention it because their skill sets are actually not older researchers, but people who came through at different time points have less of. So kind of mentioning that actually I, I can do this. Um, these things are limited to word count, obviously, as, you, as you'll notice, but kind of being able to bring through those skills, what you've learned is the important things. And then again, 
I kind of split my paragraph and gone into output and said that I presented this orally at a local meeting, a national conference poster, um, and the integrated degree prize. Um, so what did I get from that? And then in the last sentence, so lots of you I'm sure will be linked in with lots of projects and be like, oh, I'm probably not going to publish before I apply for that, which I was conscious of at the time as well. This paper did come out. This paper came out about six months ago now. Um, but if you've got a paper in progress, a manuscript you're working on, mention it because it shows that there's something you might not necessarily explicitly score a point for, but it shows that you're ongoing engaged with that. Um, so that I was learning about the structure of an academic paper, how you submit it, the peer review process. Um, and I said that these were ongoing learning experiences, making yourself seem engaged. And it, again, kind of buzzwords, things like mentorship, clinician scientists, and kind of learning how you would pursue that career. Um, they often ask you, it was a common interview question, I think it was one of the ones that kind of came up in the ones they asked last year about kind of issues of a clinical academic career. And a kind of awareness and insight into that, the, you are going to be splitting yourself in multiple ways. You are going to have limited time. It adds different stress or adds different challenges and skill sets that you need to learn alongside being a clinician and things like unforeseen challenges. And it's a good one to say into actually in terms of why you want to do SFP is that you're interested in doing this anyway and you want that protected time, that protected experience, that protected mentorship to allow you to engage in that. Um, and, and that's a, a strong rationale for why you want this career, why you want these opportunities, why you want to take further your experiences and your skill sets that you've already developed. They don't want you to be the finished product. You're not applying to them as a professor. You're saying that I have the potential to do a lot with this and trying to kind of persuade them almost through these short answers um, or through, through interview is just really important in terms of saying it in a nice concise manner and really drawing out what's important. Um, and in terms of saying in clinical research and cl uh, translational research and clinical trials. And again, when I wrote these, didn't know exactly what I'd be doing, um, but I knew that was interesting in translational research, no translational research fellow, clinical trials. Um, I saw a number of clinical trial patients today. Um, so actually putting this stuff down in paper is something really useful just to crystallize your, your thoughts in terms of what you want to do. I am aware of time. Um, I have proceeded to go through all of the ones which I answered effectively, a lot of them are the same, these are slightly longer. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything particular that would be useful in terms of non-academic achievements, um, things that are good to talk about. I spoke about in kind of in two things um, in terms of charity fundraising and I spoke about having a part-time job at university. Um, some people do, some people don't, um, but actually that I think went down really well. Um, in terms of balancing clinical academic commitments, in terms of what I learned from that, in terms of having already worked in a team. Things like the teamwork question, if you work in TK Maxx, if you work in Next, those are really good examples to weave in because actually it shows an availability and a, an awareness of a workplace um, that you wouldn't otherwise get as a medical student. So things like that can work really well, even if you're like, I, have, I, I, didn't, I didn't sail around the world, I didn't climb the Himalayas. There's always stuff you can chat about. Um, yeah, and then other things about leadership. So I haven't gone in specifically to the teaching leadership ones explicitly because um, I didn't apply for those programmes. I don't have a great knowledge base in those. But leadership, things like societies, things like directing teaching programmes, things like if you have ever could have taught revision sessions to younger medical students, again, brilliant. Um, and saying things like teaching, always kind of mentioning that you've received feedback from it. So those are the things that they're used to seeing from their trainees. So things like applying for IMT, you have to apply with evidence of formal feedback of teaching. So you're putting things in a way that they are used to hearing. They're used to being like, oh yeah, that's what the good trainees do. Um, because they'll look at you in junior lens, but they're trying to look at you as baby doctors, junior doctors. So speaking to them in language they understand um, is really relevant. So in terms of kind of top tips, um, we're going to go and chat about interviews um, and things like camp and star structures are good for those. Camp is clinical academic management and personal, and sorry, situational task. Um, <laughs> the good was in A and R. Um, sorry, just on, put them on the spot there. I'll check that before, before we finish. Um, but kind of using structures how you're answering these things. And like I said, using the language that researchers do, almost kind of making things abstract, like using words that you've seen in papers and seen in kind of 
person specifications and things. List of three, don't be listing thing after thing after thing. You can just draw attention to these things. Um, and again, mentioning output specifically, even if it's not, if you don't think it's the best output in the world, if you're like, oh, I did a local poster, it's totally fine. You're engaged in this admission process, you're engaged in presenting to people, you're learning from that. And the next step you would like to do is you are awaiting results from an abstract submission, you are working on a manuscript. Even if that manuscript doesn't go anywhere, things get rejected all the time, it's part of the learning process, include it. And like I said, ongoing work, lessons learned. Um, and again, I can emphasize on the fact that you're not wanting to be the finished product. If, if you were, I've heard of people being kind of overqualified almost for SFP and AFP. Um, you want to show what you want to get from that position. Um, there's not no point in doing it otherwise. Um, but you want to show actually, I would take the best of this opportunity because this is what I want to do. This is what I want to learn. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Sorry, I've ran, we're, ran slightly over. Um, that's my email address, my Twitter there. Um, I'm really happy to be contacted before applications time um, and just kind of anything in general to help. But if you're attending things like this, you're, you're well in your way. Um, and hopefully that was helpful just to get kind of oversight of things there. I will stop talking now, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was really useful. Um, so we'll move on to Soham now. So I, um, it's my pleasure to introduce. Lovely to meet you all. My name's Soham. I was an AFP a uh, year ago. It's lovely to see so many of you thinking of applying for an SFP. Um, I'm sure what an SFP has been covered and the purposes of the SFP and the minutiae of getting an SFP in terms of doing a white space questions and the interview process. But I'm going to go a bit deeper into the interview and what you can expect to see. Now, this is going to be a generalized overview and each center does it a bit differently. So for example, London would do it differently to West Midlands, Cambridge would do it differently to Oxford, Southampton, Southampton would do it differently to Holland York. So it's worthwhile just having a look at the specific website to figure out exactly how they do it. But this is going to be a generalized overview. So the interview process comprises usually of a personal station, an academic station, and a clinical management station. And I'll go through each of these in turn. But kind of broad advice is, for your interviews, preparation is key. So I would say that if you're thinking of doing an SFP or an AFP um, right about now, to start preparing your white space question, because they're a good way to to kind of write down your further interview answers down the line. For example, why you want this AFP or SFP and why you want that deanery are critical questions in the white spaces. And they're also critical questions in the interview itself. And trying to understand why you want the AFP kind of leads you into understanding what clinical acad academia is and whether you really want that career. And similarly, your white space questions gives you lots of examples of leadership, teamwork, teaching, research, audits, all very good uh, criteria for, for answering questions. They might ask you about when have you demonstrated ability to think on the spot? When have you demonstrated the ability to, to demonstrate some ingenuity? You, know, you can always talk about your leadership, your teamwork, some teaching that you've done. Um, and in addition to your personal station, uh, even, even if it is you know, a personal kind of question about why you want to do academia, it's always okay to bring in some critical appraisal and, and highlight positives as well as some of the negatives. And in some interviews, and you'll know which of these they are, have a recent paper you've read, just because they won't present you with anything. They'll expect you to showcase what you've read and what you've discussed. And make sure it's not a paper that's full of flaws. I think something that people like to do is just show up that they can pull real off a load of limitations about a really bad paper. And, and that doesn't really show any, uh, you know, any additional academic thought because a bad paper is a bad paper. A good paper that's missed out on a few things or that has further papers that need to be done to complete what it's already started, you know, that's what academic medicine is all about. You're not gonna you know, use a bad study to, to change management issues, but you might look at a good study and think, you know, what are the additional things we need to think about for my patient cohort to truly be able to treat them appropriately? For example, if you're thinking of you know, my specialty of putting in shunts into people's brains, there was a great trial that showed that if you put antibiotics on these shunts, you reduce the chances of people getting infections. However, you know, in some local units, they started using this and they found there was an increased rate of infections as opposed to their previous practice of just silver shunts. 
and they found out that's because registrars and trainees were, were more kind of laser fay putting these putting these shunts in because they were antibiotic coated. So there was a behavioral change that needed to accompany the the interventional change. And so so those are things that you can think about when you're critically appraising evidence and why things may not have worked out the, the way that people expected it to. Um, and as per the day, always make sure that you know you're you're your best self uh, in terms of how you appear just because unfortunately some people do start marking the minute you walk through the door or the minute you open the zoom camera just because that's the kind of people they are you can't change that and you won't know that before you attend so just, just try and dress as smartly as you can and when answering the questions make sure you answer that question and not the question that you hoped that they'd be asking you and if you feel that at times that you know you're going off on tangents just ask them to repeat the question um, and try and be as concise as possible. So if you're asked to talk about a leadership experience, use a framework to help you talk about that leadership experience, but don't spend two to three minutes talking about it. Have a few bullet points that you just want to get across to them, but keep it casual, keep it like a conversation you'd have with a friend. And, and I think that's the best way to get a story across in a concise way that's actually engaging and people want to listen to. And just make sure that whenever you talk, as I said, start, make it sound like you're you're talking to a friend. It's a story you want to tell them. So you're kind of enthusiastic about it. You're passionate about it rather than just trying to get across a formulaic answer because no one wants to listen to something that's pre-prepared, that's done, that's kind of done and dusted. It's not something that comes from the heart. It's just something that you've written and just rehearsed over and over again. But also don't be afraid if they kind of push you about it on your answers and ask you, why did you say that? Why did you choose this paper? They just want to see how far you can go and whether you can defend your justifications. And it's kind of a good cop, bad cop style. So I wouldn't worry too much. Now, I've talked about these various different structures. And I think one good structure that I saw being talked about a second ago was CAMP. That's Clinical Academic Management Personal. And really, whenever you're talking about any of these questions, you can have an answer for all of these. So for example, leadership wise, you can have examples of clinical academic management and personal leadership and you can showcase them all during your answer or if you know they ask you specifically about an extracurricular leadership example don't talk about a clinical one don't talk about uh, an academic one you know talk about something personal to you uh, so i don't know if you were the captain of a of the netball team or if you led uh, a group of individuals to help some homeless people you know those are all kind of stories that are interesting in and of themselves and if they're passions of yours and that's why you did them that they they come alive rather than you just recite i led a stereotype uh, sorry i led a systematic review on on a certain disease subset and i found out that a b and c happens because i made sure that the group did screening at this stage the data analysis at this stage and i coordinated everything because that's just quite dry and, and doesn't come across as to why you're interested in it or why you want to do it but you can always name drop stuff so as i said you can have this personal really exciting story but also kind of give really short snippets of how it's relevant to clinical academic management let's say for example you led a group of people to help homeless people get some food you can relate it back to some academic piece that you did that highlighted the socioeconomic deprivation of, of certain groups of people you can highlight how it's important that people get food and nourishment because of clinical conditions they might suffer from without food and water you can highlight how important it was to manage everyone to ensure that you know, people had a golden direction that they knew what they were doing. Each one, everyone had their own individual roles, but everyone was coordinated and everyone came together. And even though you're talking about a personal story, you've related it to all three. In similar ways um, to these personal stories, think about how exactly you want to say it. And as I said, you're, you're telling a friend a story. So you want to start off by telling them about the situation so they kind of understand what you're talking about. Then you want to tell them about what you did and why you had to do it. And then you want to end with what the end result with what the end result was. Some people sometimes just mention the situation and the action. For example, when you're talking about an audit, I often hear people tell me that they've done an audit on this and they've got these results, but they never actually tell me. So what have they done with those results? Have they gone and changed something? Have they gone and reaudited and found an improvement? How have they sustained that improvement? Those are the things that round off that story and, and don't leave a thread hanging where people are like, okay, so what's next? Similarly, when you're dealing with some tricky patient situations in your clinical situation, you can have a framework in place, as in, have you sought all the information you need to ensure that what you're doing is safe? 
Have you always made sure that patient safety is paramount? Have you taken the initiative to do things that you can with your competencies? Have you escalated when appropriate to get the support that you need and also to support the patient or the people that you need to give support to? I previously talked about critical appraisals and one good book is by Tricia Greenhall, who's become quite famous during the COVID-19 pandemic as a, uh, as a stalwart for COVID being sp spread by air droplets and the need for wearing masks. And she'll talk you through her time as a GP and a professor and how she's kind of introduced evidence-based medicine uh, to, to the wider community in her early formative years, which you guys are all in, showcasing that you guys can make a difference at a very early stage. Um, my top tip for you guys is to praise clinical papers of your choosing from any research base, but it doesn't need to be something you're interested in. Often, you know, if you praise papers from research uh, backgrounds that you're not so familiar with, you won't be kind of thrown off if they give you, if I don't know, if you're interested in plastic surgery and they give you an influenza paper on the day, you're not going to be thrown off by how to understand the results, how to interpret its findings and what the implications might be because you're used to reading virology papers. So um, I would try and branch out from whatever kind of discipline that you're interested in. And when appraising papers, I often say the most important thing is to tell everyone what the key aspects are. What are the population, uh, what, are, what is the population the paper's looking? What's the main intervention the paper's looking at? What are the control of the paper? What's the control of the intervention being compared against? And what are the outcomes? Let's say, for example, we had glioblastoma multiforme, which is a horrendous brain tumor that often causes patients to die within 12 to 24 months. If you're looking at a primary outcome of five years mortalities with two different treatments, with no intermediate mortality rates at all, they're going to be exactly the same. But once again, you know, mortality is not the only thing of interest. If you increase someone's lifespan from 12 to 24 months, but they're just bedridden and comatose, that's not much of a gain. But if you increase their lifespan from 12 months to 24 months and they're functionally independent, that's a huge gain. So what outcomes are we looking at? Are we just looking at kind of binary or are we looking at more of the context of quality of life, what the patient wants about them? And the same is true for the population intervention and control. Think about these nuances rather than just, okay, this is what we're doing. That's it. Think about what aren't they doing. And whenever you're critiquing um, evidence, whilst this pyramid may be true, remember that, you know, each of these is, is, you know, only as good as the data it's collecting. A meta-analysis of case controls and court studies is only as good as the best court study. And an RCT would be much better than that meta-analysis because it's a meta-analysis of, of poor quality studies. Similarly, if there's an RCT using data that's biased, that's poorly collected, that there's no way to validate the data, you know, it's, it's no better than, than any of these other studies. So, so just don't just automatically think, oh, this is an RCT, hence it must be a good study. Actually go through it properly and think about what has it, what has the paper considered and what has it not considered. Um, a good thing for all of you to do is know key terms and statistics. If you've all got your phones, I'd recommend that you scan this now. Um, it's an anchor, some anchor flashcards for you guys to practice uh, defining key terms in your interviews for academic interviews so that you know exactly what a p-value is, you know exactly what a confidence interval is, you know why we use 95% confidence intervals, you know why we use standard errors. Um, you, you understand the difference between a superiority and a non-inferiority trial. Um, so just I'll give you 10 seconds if you haven't yet to scan it and then I'll move on. All right, hopefully that's enough time for you all to have scanned and got the Anki flashcards. Now, when you're then analyzing a paper, you've done the PICO, you wanna now look at the details as to how good was the study actually. So the next thing to do is use an acronym CIRCAD, that's the sample size, inclusion, exclusion criteria for the population, how a population was recruited, any confounding factors and biases affecting the population, whether the analysis was set out uh, beforehand, and the duration of the study or length follow-up. Uh, and these are things that you can all think about. If the QR code isn't working, um, I will try and fix that. But, but if not, uh, Trisha Greenhall's book has all the key terms you need to know. So uh, go back to that and um, have a look inside that. Um, also, you can just put down in the comments some things that you want defining and I can define it for you now. Now, what, now, in terms of bias and confounding, understand the difference between them, understand the different types of bias, how there's 
selection biases, how there's uh, assessment biases as well, and how they and how they contribute to different um, different types of results result issues. And certainly, understand what confounding is and how you can adjust for confounding and how you can make sure that your results are are best uh, are best characterize the effect of the exposure that you're interested in or the outcome. And then after you've done all that, consider whether the study that you've done is actually generalizable to the wider population. For example, if you only looked at really healthy white males aged 18 to 34, are this, is the study results, are the study results going to be applicable to women? I think uh, there's a huge amount of databases out there suggesting that it's not. Like, let's talk about cars, for example. A lot of car safety design is done on men. And some people might argue, you know, rightfully so, they're more likely to get into car accidents. But because of that, a lot of car design features don't protect women during car accidents. Like the way that the bag come out sometimes can do trauma to, to people's faces because it's designed to account for a certain height and a certain weight build. Same, same for seat belts. It's, it's designed to prevent uh, torso, uh, torso injury in males. And if you're a very short woman, you know, the seat, the seat belts aren't gonna, gonna help you in the same way. And it's all about thinking exactly who has the study been designed for and who, who is it true to and who would this intervention actually help? And whether this is the group that most needs the help, or whether we need to open up the study to other groups and whether there's been a bias due to people dropping out and hence the final study sample is biased in a certain way because those who have dropped out really did really badly with the intervention and didn't want to be followed up. So the intervention is actually a lot better than it really is. In terms of the clinical scenarios, the things to think about are, have you got an ACE prepared in your men? Can you just reel it off in the back, like the back of your hand? Do you know exactly what to do with an airway? Do you know what to do to assess breathing? Same for C, same for D, same for E. Preparing for your finals as your final year medics is really helpful for getting your ACE uh, sorted and knowing about management of various different diseases. And the Oxford Hamlet of Clinical Medicine is a good starting point for getting the basics right. Is anyone brave enough to want to do an A to E case slash do I have enough time to run through some mocks? I will ask the moderator whether I should wrap it up so we can have a panel discussion or whether we should, whether someone wants to do a mock case. No, go for it. If someone wants to, if someone wants to volunteer. Just pop your hand up if you want to volunteer. If no takers, then I can wrap up. We can go to the panel discussion. All right. No worries. So we can go to the panel discussion, but as I said, make sure you manage the airway, ensuring that you've asked for help early. If there's any signs of airway obstruction, ensure that you measure the SATs and respiratory rate, auscultate and circulation, ensure that you've got some cannulas in place, ensure you've taken some blood, put probably VCG on, disability, never forget the uh, never forget don't ever forget glucose but also do your gcs and pupils if you can exposure remember to check the whole patient and check the temperatures and this is another case if you want to do uh, as i said make sure you read about the interview and dress to impress uh, here are some further sites for you guys to read about um hope that helped thank you very much everyone all right over to uh taylor Thank you very much. That was um, really interesting and really useful. Um, so yeah, I think uh, thank you for all for attending today. I'm just quickly going to share one more slide. Um, so yeah, thank you for all attending. Um, and just to let you know that if you're not aware already, um, Bonus is launching its second cycle of its mentorship scheme, um, which is starting the next couple of months. Um, so applications for mentees and mentors for that, if you know anyone who would like to be a mentor, um, are now open. Um, does anyone have any questions before we end and then we can um, call it a day? So if there's any questions, if you want to pop your hand up or put up anything in the chat. Um, in terms of the recording, um, it will um, be put on our YouTube channel um, at the at some point is the plan on the bonus YouTube channel. And um, the QR code, I don't think it was working in your talk, um, but I think you said that they were 
available in the in their book. Is that right? Yeah. Cool. Does anyone have any questions? Um, so we've got a question from Alice um, quickly. Um, is it really difficult to obtain an SFP without papers? I don't mind coming in on that one. I had no papers um, when I applied for SFP and I got my two top offers in the deanery. So uh, no, I wouldn't let that, let that put you off in any capacity. Just show what you have done with the projects you've done. Um, and output at medical student level is highly variable. Um, and so, no, essentially, if you have papers, absolutely brilliant. And um, if you don't, then that's probably much more, much more the norm um, at the level of application. So I wouldn't let that put you off in any capacity. OK, great, thank you. Um, and we've got a question for Saham. Um, so would you be able to work through the case yourself <laughs> quickly? Uh, yeah, let me just reshare it. So you're the FY1 covering the medical wards of your hospitals overnight. You received two simultaneous bleeps. One bleep is a nurse calling from the gastro ward about a patient who's dropped their GCS. The other bleed is a nurse calling from the geriatrics ward about a patient who's now DR bleeding. All right. So you've got two bleeps. The first thing you want to do is make sure that you've got enough details about both of them. Uh, so far, you've been told that some patients dropped their GCS, but you don't know what from to what to. It's 15 to 14. That's very different from 15 to 3. So try and get some more details about that. And secondly, what is PR bleeding? Do they mean they've got some some blood on, on a piece of paper or are they hemorrhaging blood right now, they're hemodynamically unstable. Once you've got both that information, try and try and assess who's a priority from the A2E. You know, if you drop their GCS, they're not maintaining their airway, that's a priority, even if the PR bleeding is bleeding out and they're hemodynamically unstable. Remember, you're not the only F, you're not the only doctor in the hospital. So if they are both emergencies, i.e. The, is the airway compromised and you're hemodynamically unstable, ask the hemodynamically unstable patient to contact the reg or SHO get them there urgently and just let them know that you're dealing with an airway compromise. At the same time, to also put out a bleep for the anesthetic team and i.e. through the two to two call for the airway compromised patient and to do a full set of ops for both these patients when the doctors arrive. Then I would make my way to the drop TCS provided they've dropped the not maintain their airway and be thinking of the differentials. It's from a gas reward. So you know the things that you can be thinking about for a drop TCS is have you got an electrolyte imbalance? Is that where they've dropped the GCS? Have they got low glucose? Is that why they dropped their GCS? Have they aspirated because you know they're kind of confused and they've not, they've uh, they're now not getting enough air into their lungs and they're getting hypoxic? Have they just had um, have they had too much uremia in their bloods and hence they're getting encephalitis or, or encephalopathy rather to be more precise? Um, have they also had a bleed that's just been unnoticed? Now they're even that unstable. That's why the GCS is dropping. Uh, have a have a kind of framework in your mind. Um, a framework that's quite good, I think, is um, MJ Threads, if, but I can't remember what it stands for anymore. It's one of, one of my friends who used it. If you search it, MJ Threads, you can come up, come up with a framework as to how, how to think through these things. Um, on arriving at the scene, if for a patient who's compromised their airway, I would have a look to see if they actually have a patient airway or not. Uh, if they don't, I would start some airway maneuvers, including a bag bath mouth and ensuring they've got 50 liters of oxygen going through into them. I'd really be hoping for an anesthetic support at this point in time. If not, uh, I'll ask for a nurse who's competent to bag the valve mask while I can continue with the airway uh, with ABCD. If there is no nurse who's competent, I'd have to stay at the airway until I had a second pair of hands who could start from B to E. Provided I've got a nurse who, or someone who can maintain the airway, put them in a jaw thrust and um, bag the valve mask, I would assess their, I'd assess their respiratory rate, their stats, listen to their chest, check for any expansion, check their trachea central, if I was any, if I was concerned, I'd ask for portable chest X-ray. See, I'd ensure they had bilateral cannula in place. I'd take some bloods at this point in time, including um, usenes, FBCs, CRP, LFTs, urea, um, and any other thoughts that I had for why their patient had dropped their GCS. Uh, I would also uh, like a 12 EDCG at this point in time. At D, I'd check their pupils. I'd check their GCS. I'd check to make sure that their glucose was all right. Um, take a look at their VBG that I hopefully have taken at C. And at E, I check their temperature and check for any other abnormalities such as blood, blood stain sheets. And hopefully by this time, I'd have some senior support to deal with this case. If they've dropped their GCS due to low glucose, give them some glucose. If they've dropped their GCS due to deranged electrolytes, I try and figure out what's the cause and try and fix that as appropriate, et cetera. Hope that helps.
Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions quickly before we finish. Um, so um, what about additional degrees? So we're not having an additional degree put you off um, being a successful candidate in any way. I, th I think it's really a case of um, the kind of, again, um, I wouldn't let it put you off applying in any way. Um, I haven't looked at how they score this recently. Certainly in things like IMT, they've actually removed additional degrees um, in terms of uh, scoring points. Um, so I think as an overall thing in medicine, they're looking a bit less at that. Um, what have you done at medical school otherwise? What projects have you been involved in? What's your leadership? What's your teaching experience? Um, what's your research experience across perhaps summer holidays, perhaps across um, like specialist um, attachments in medical school? So is what is what you is what you've done. People will have done much more without doing an additional degree in medical school than some people who did additional degrees. Um, so I, I would not let that not let that put you off either and um, I don't know so how much to come in on that um, I come from a background of having done an additional degree but I don't think it's a prerequisite in any way yeah it's not a prerequisite um, I also did an intake degree but there are plenty of people with um, SFPs with that one so uh, don't let it put you off I mean there's no harm trying and unless you know you think it's going to impact your clinical performance with medical schools in any way then it's just another application really. Great, thank you. Um, and then one question about specific advice regarding securing a neurosurgical AFP. Um, so I presume you want to be a neurosurgeon. Uh, okay. I think the AFP is an AFP. They're not specifically looking at what clinical jobs you're going for during the AFP because it's a centralized uh, process by that university. Obviously, if you want the neurosurgery AFP, then just be aware that there are other people gunning for those spots, especially because they're quite far in between. I think there's only six or seven in the country. Um, so if you only want a neurosurgery AFP, think about whether or not you want to rank the others or what's going to happen in in terms of in terms of where you end up if you rank, let's say, fourth or fifth, there's only three jobs in that place. Uh, but ultimately, the advice goes with, as with any other SFP, to make sure that you, you know, present yourself the best way you can. You give a good clinical interview, you give a good academic interview. Cambridge specifically, there is a specific neuroscience themed um, AFP where they ask you a neuroscience themed clinical question. So know how to manage epilepsy, know how to manage chronic subdurals, know how to manage extradurals, like the common emergencies that you get. Um, but that's pretty much it. Perfect, thank you. So I Thanks. think we'll have to... Oh, sorry, I was going to say oh, just... Sorry. No, no, mm -hmm. is, this a, is this a small one? Um, and nothing particularly to neurosurgery, but I think um, it's a valid thing to think about which ones you're going to rank. Because um, it certainly happened some people I knew who did really well um, in applying for the AFP programme, but they had ranked every single... The, what happens is they ranked in every single AFP in Scotland and got offered one in Inverness. And actually, upon reflection, didn't want to be a doctor in Inverness. Um, and they'd done so well in the process, actually, probably if they'd just ranked 10, that they would actually do. Didn't get one of those in the first round, they might well have got one of those in the second round. Um, so think about what, what jobs you would actually uh, you would actually do if you got offered them, um, I think is really relevant. To, um, and whether that's to be a neurosurgeon or otherwise, um, is, is just a, a point to think, mainly to do with location, I think. Yeah, that's really useful. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I think we'll just have to end it there now. Um, I don't mind I don't know if you both are happy to put your emails or um, some way to contact you in the chat if anyone else got any other questions. Um, I think there were a few more on the chat, um, but unfortunately we haven't had time to go through them all. Um, but yeah, I'd like to thank you on behalf of Bonus and everyone here today on talking today. It's been really great and really useful too. Um, and yeah, um, there's the link is in the chat to apply to the bonus mentorship scheme. Um, and thank you all for attending. Thanks so much. Great session. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.